I'm Morgan Pechma, Editor-in-Chief of City and State, and this is Last Look. Today, our guest is former public advocate Betsy Gottbaum. Betsy, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. In 2001, you beat Norman Siegel in a runoff uh, for public advocate. Uh, there's been a lot of talk this year that the runoff should be eliminated. Where, where do you stand on that? Well, I think the runoff in general should be eliminated. I'm, I've come to the conclusion that runoffs are just, it, it's just too costly and not enough people are interested and it doesn't, I, I, I just don't think we need it and there's an easier way and less expensive way of doing it. So um, I, I think we should probably figure out a better way of doing it. I don't know how to do that because I'm not an expert in elections, but uh, I definitely agree this is ridiculous. But you'd be open to exploring some option like instant runoff voting. Yes, instant runoff voting, I would be certainly, I don't know enough about it, but I would think that would be a very good possibility. Mayor Bloomberg was a real adversary to the Office of Public Advocate when you were the public advocate, and he scaled back the, the funding uh, dramatically. Do you think there still is a role for the public advocate in the city, or should that office be eliminated? No, I think it's an absolutely essential role, and I plan to call on my two former former and my successor um, to write an op-ed for a lot of these uh, publications, particularly the Daily News, which says the office should be eliminated. And let me very t tell you very quickly why. Uh, the, the office is supposed to be the ombudsman for the city of New York. And you have 311, which is a wonderful system. It costs $65 million to put in place. Uh, the public advocates ombudsman service is much smaller, much more uh, discreet, in the sense that if 311 refers you to an agency or to a particular issue, that's wonderful, but they just refer. Sometimes people can't get anywhere with a reference. They need somebody who will actually walk them through whatever the problem is. And I always give the example, um, in when I was public advocate, the, one, of the, uh, one of the ombudsmen came to me and said, you know, we, we've gotten this, a lot of calls from Queens on water bills going up, and it, does, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I said, so let's look into it. We would take our policy people who were experts in water, um, they would figure out why the water bills were being increased. They would see that there was a rash of water bill increases all over Queens, and we would then do something about it. So we would, it was a mistake they had made an enormous mistake. So we were able to, through that little bit of research, reduce a lot of people's water bills. There were many more serious things that we were able to do. And what I object to the most is the way in which this office was constructed. And the mayor, who controls the budget of the, of the public advocate, should not control the budget. Right. It should be given a baseline budget. I always said $5 million, which is like one-tenth of one-hundredth a percent of the city budget, should be a baseline uh, amount of money that's given to the public advocate's office and that the ombudsman's function, which is in the charter itself, should be expanded, enhanced, work very closely with 311, which is something I always wanted to do. It would be a brilliant and wonderful thing for New Yorkers to help those New Yorkers who need help the most. Do you think it's appropriate for the public advocate to be uh, in the line, first in the line of succession for the mayor? You know, that was always something that it's there, it's very important, uh, because obviously if something happens to the mayor, you, you want to have somebody who has been elected uh, ready to step in. Um, I wouldn't fight over it if it was taken away, but it's fine. Look, Bill de Blasio is probably going to be our mayor, and that's the greatest uh, reason to have it be in line for succession. And you were the third woman elected to citywide office in New York City. Um, Letitia James has the opportunity today of perhaps becoming the fourth. How come there have been so few women elected to citywide office? Some people have said that Christine Quinn, that was one of the reasons that she was unsuccessful this year in the Democratic primary. Do you think that there's any legitimacy to no, that argument? I, I don't think it's because you are, you are a woman or you're not a woman. I think it is very, very difficult to run for citywide office. Um, it is, it is it, constant, constant campaigning, constant uh, being out there, keeping up on the issues. You know, most women don't have uh, uh, wives who will take care of all the things around the house. And when I ran, and I ran twice citywide, I actually ran more because there were runoffs, um, uh, this, my whole entire 
a domestic life fell apart. And that's very difficult, especially if you have children um, and, and if you have a husband, which I do, uh, and you have to take care of things. And it just, you don't have the time and, and you're running all the time. Uh, so most women don't have the, the, the time to do it is one thing. The second thing is it is grueling. It's grueling on you psychologically. It's, it's very difficult to constantly be uh, attacked which is what you are, especially when, you're, when you are elected. And it is difficult for women to, to have to deal with that, plus the, the domestic issue of who's going to take care of that, who's going to do the laundry? <laughs> well, uh, you created the Commission on School Governance at the request of the state legislature. Um, how do you think mayoral control has, has gone over these three terms of, of Mayor Bloomberg, and would you change anything uh, about mayoral control? Uh, actually, I, I think mayoral control, I'm definitely in favor of it. I think that there have to be a few more checks on, on, on the issue of mayoral control. Um, I believe that probably the educational panel should consist of fewer people appointed by the mayor. And, and that again, I, I will quote from my, my, um, my friend and former candidate for mayor, Bill Thompson, if you can't convince one or two people that, that what policies you're trying to, to introduce aren't good, you know what, they aren't good policies. So I, I truly believe that there should be fewer members appointed by the mayor on that, because I do think there were a lot of things that happened in, 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 or have happened or are still happening in the Department of Education that should be looked at more carefully. You have spoken out against charter schools in the past, um, saying that you, you believe that fundamentally poverty is the problem with the city's education system. Do you still uh, feel the same way about charters, given uh, President Obama and, and Mayor Bloomberg's real support of the growth of the charter school movement? Well, I think if charter schools are there to offer really good ideas about how schools should be run, I think that's fine. And I'm not against charter schools. I never was. In fact, I helped a couple of my friends who started charter schools it, do that. Um, but you, you're never going to charterize all the schools in New York City. And I think that probably it's better to put those resources in the public schools. Um, but we've got charter schools. Let's see what they do. But my understanding is they aren't doing that much better than the public schools are. So I think you have to look at it very carefully. I think some charter schools are probably really good and should be encouraged. But I definitely believe that charter schools should pay rent if they're sharing space with other schools. And I'm not sure I'm for that co-location anyway. Because if you're in a school where one group gets more and better things than the other group, that's, that's not a good situation. I, I, so I have a lot of problems with some of the issues in charter schools. Not against them, um, but I'd, I'd like to see how, how effective the charter schools are vis-a-vis -vis the public schools. And anything you can learn, take from a charter school and put into a public school, that's fine if it's good pra best practices. I haven't actually seen a lot of that. Now at the end of the Bloomberg administration, we're kind of reflecting upon the, the history of the mayoralty. You served under many mayors, starting with Mayor Lindsay, uh, and you are also the president of the New York Historical Society. In your estimation, who is our city's greatest mayor ever? Oh, Gad. Uh, well, I was very close to and loved Ed Koch, so I would have to say, in my in my knowledge, or from my knowledge, uh, it would be Ed Koch. Um, I didn't know Mayor LaGuardia. Uh, I worked for Mayor Lindsay, yes. Um, I was not working for Mayor Bloomberg. I think he's been a good mayor. I'm, I'm not going to criticize him. There are many things I can criticize in Mayor Bloomberg, but I think it, for the ha most part, he's been a good mayor. But I have to say Ed Koch. Betsy Gottbaum, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of Last Look. For more episodes, please join us on the web at www.cityandstateny.com.